Hey guys, this is Fadi from Harpoon Productions and welcome to another video. After I did my last video about the Orion Gen 3 full patching and routing setup, I've gotten several people, uh, they requested, hey, you wanna do the Gen 4? We have the Gen 4 now and I know the console looks very different. So today's video, I wanna address the complete routing setup and a walkthrough of the console of the Orion Gen 4, the Antelope Orion Gen 4. Um, Without having to talk too much, we want to jump in really quick. I want to, I'm going to do similar to the Gen 3. I want to do all the buttons in the console, all the features in the console, what did that look like, and how can you use it unrouted and set it up with your DAW. Um, so let's just jump in right away. Okay, now that we're here, let's dig in. So this is the console for the Orion Gen 4, the 32 plus, and they have significantly changed it. They made a lot of upgrades and it looks very similar to the Galaxy console and some of their newer consoles uh, versus the Gen 3, it has the older model of the console. There's a lot of cool features in this console that I really like, so we're gonna walk through it here in just a second and uh, walk through all the settings and the details of the console and routing and all that kind of stuff. So first, let's start with all the buttons on the console and what we see. Um, so you guys see here, at the very beginning, you have two, it's like that screen is split into the meters, I have meters, SPDIF, ADAT, and meters. So SPDIF is basically showing me the two SPDIF channels. I can link them and I can do trim to them, which is pretty cool that you can access from here. Same for the ADAT. The Gen 4 only has one ADAT input, so you got one. Uh, you got only eight channels versus the Gen 3 had two ADAT inputs and you get 16 channels. Same thing, you can link them, trim it. And then meters is just a preview of meters. And in the meters, it's the same idea. You got display one and display two. On display one, you can show whatever you want. There's so many different options. Right now I'm selecting, see all my line inputs on the left side. And then on the M2, I am, I think I believe I had the monitors output. Yeah, monitor output, just my left and right speakers output. And you, you can make these two views of anything. And these actually are also, M1 and M2 are on the actual unit, the, uh, the rack unit. The mon they have two little screens on both sides of the knob, and that would be the left screen and the right screen, so kind of same idea. And you can see those on the display of the unit itself, of the rack unit. Okay, now monitoring, this is new, that was not on the Gen 3, and when you select here, it opens a different world for monitoring. And uh, right now, because we're monitoring uh, stereo, not surround, so you guys can see, here's my left and right speaker, and here's the monitor for the left and the right speaker. This is the surround level, dim, mute, and then it has like a little separate player that you can uh, move around or pin it to a specific place. And then this is all surround features, which we'll get to in just a second. And this is showing you your monitor levels pre or post all the surround features uh, that are being implemented, which is one of the main differences about the Gen 4 that we'll kind of go through here in just a second. Um, okay, so after that, you got your, um, let's grab that top banner up here. And then on that top banner, you have on and off, turning console on and off, clock, internal clock, or different source for clock, external sync if you're running word clock or external source clock, sample rate, here's your settings, and then on the settings here, you guys can see the surround EQ, is it post or pre? And then uh, I'm running the unit right now USB, not Thunderbolt, so you can see I can select between 32 channel to 24 channels, panning law, trim, which is the same features that the Gen 3 had. And here's the oscillators, being able to play back an oscillator uh, through uh, the speakers, brightness for the unit itself, and then Thunderbolt latency. And then this one has a, a new feature that the DC coupled inputs and outputs, and that has to do with a lot of the analog synth. If you're using a lot of analog synth that requires DC coupling inputs or outputs, so you can activate or deactivate this feature. So this is just a really basic setting, not really, nothing fancy. And then, uh, so that was this button next to it. That little monitor unit that you guys can see, and this is once I connect my MRC, this would light up and then it will activate my MRC. 
uh, and then which means my MRC monitor controller is being recognized by the system and it works and works with the system. So if this is not lit up and not connected, that means your USB connection is not working or something like that, make sure you disconnect it and connect it again so that way it works fine. All right, and then under session, this is to save presets and then this has more presets in it, which is really cool. Uh, so here's like your main project session and then I'm using my Heartbeat IO and then right here you got software presets, you got five of them and then hardware presets, five of them. And um, under the software presets, you can assign those to the MRC. You have five presets that you can assign to the MRC and then the hardware presets, you can assign them to specific buttons on the hardware unit and then you can recall those, which is really cool. Uh, being able to quickly recall presets and settings. And then here's the save, undo, load presets, matrix, which is kind of very similar to the old units, not much. Here's the info, like my unit, my serial number, all that kind of stuff. Um, you guys can see like I have my heart, my quick heartbeat one in here and all what I do now, I can just click A and if I press on it, it quickly recall my routing and my presets in here. And it has the same idea as if I'm going to save something, the same as the uh, old one, you, you see here all the IOs, uh, you see what do you want to save in this preset, are you wanting to only change routing, you're only wanting to change mixer settings or IOs or IFX or whatever, uh, and then you can choose which one is being saved in that specific preset. All right, so this is, now let's go back here to really where all the work is. You got routing, mixer surround, and trims. Um, so tr let's start with the simple one, trims. Very, very similar to the uh, Gen 3. You got line input trims, line output trims. You can either change all of them or you can change some of them. Um, and then here's the levels for each one of them, that how you want to change them. Then routing, it shows you all of your IOs, ins and outs, which we're gonna talk about in a second. The mixer, it shows you the four mixers, which is mixer one, has the reverb the same as the uh, Gen 3, the reverb, the aura verb is only on mixer one, then mixer two, mixer three, and mixer four, pretty much exactly the same as the Gen 3, not much difference in here, being able to control volumes, link channels, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then surround, that's a new feature that I'm gonna get to it in just a second. So I'll start with the routing first. The first change that they made in here, which I really, really like, it looks much cleaner and looks much simpler. Uh, you can actually see all the labels a lot better. And then this whole window is, you can grab it at the edge and then you can basically shrink it up and down and expand it the, versus the other one didn't really work well. It's like the UI, the design was felt a little bit broken, but this one is much cleaner and better. Also, the uh, other thing that they changed here that I really like, you guys can see up here line inputs, DAW outputs, DAW outputs, DAW outputs, and because this one also have 128 IOs, you can hide what you're not using versus the other one, you had to see everything. So for example, here's line inputs and you guys can see my line input one to 32. If I click on it, you see it hit it, you don't see it anymore. So I'm only, which is cool because I get to select the ones, the IOs that I'm using, whether they're MADI inputs or SPDIF inputs or specific things, and I can uh, display what I wanna see and then hide what I don't wanna use or what I don't wanna see. So it makes my console a lot cleaner, makes it less overwhelming, especially for some of us who gets really confused when there's so many colors and buttons. So just having a cleaner, simpler way to see only what you need. You guys can see here, for example, MADI in 1 to 32, because I'm not using the MADI inputs. I'm only using MADI outputs, so I'm hiding the inputs. And then you have the same on the output at the bottom, same thing. Here's line outputs, monitor output. You can hide and unhide whatever you want. And here's your four mixers and all that kind of stuff. That's a really one of the biggest changes that they made on the routing for the and on the console for the Gen 4, and I believe the Galaxy is the same way. Um, all right, let's talk inputs and outputs. And if uh, if you've seen the Gen 3 video, you would understand a lot. This would might sound like repetition, but I, I kind of have to because for us who have not seen the Gen 3 video, then they need to understand this. The way that the Orion interface works, which is a little bit different, they have a whole bunch of inputs, a whole bunch of outputs, and 
uh, and then you have to patch the inputs to the outputs and the outputs to the inputs however you want them to be. It's like a complete customized patch bay. So the top part is inputs, the bottom part are outputs, and think of it this way, any interface have a set of analog inputs that goes into the interface, they're physical analog converters inside the interface, and then it has a set of digital inputs inside the interface, which is your uh, SPDIF or ADAT or MADI, all the digital inputs, and then it has a set of analog outputs, which is the physical converters that sets to the speakers, and then it has a set of digital outputs, which are ADAT, SPDIF, virtual, all that kind of stuff. So on the Gen 4, you have yourself, similar to the Gen 3, 32 analog inputs, 32 analog outputs, and on the outputs you have a two speaker outputs left and right. So these are the analog inputs and analog outputs. Now for the digital, there's one small difference. So on the Gen 4, you have only one set of ADAT input, one set of ADAT outputs, which is H channel digital in, A channel digital out, and they took away the second one, but instead they give you two sets of MADI inputs and outputs, which means instead of only having a 64 channel of digital output MADI, digital input MADI, you got two of them, so you got 128 of MADI digital IOs, which is absolutely phenomenal. It's more than what you, you needed. Massive big studios. And then you still have SPDIF inputs and outputs, so which is a stereo channel SPDIF input, stereo channel SPDIF output. And then you obviously have the, whether it's a USB or a Thunderbolt, which is your virtual playback outputs and playback inputs, which is like being recorded into your DAW. And then the main difference on the Gen 4, they took out the AFX, uh, which is the DSP plugin processing to be able to monitor using their own DSP chip plugins uh, to listen to stuff being monitored that way. And instead, they created something here, it's called surround output, and then I'm gonna do surround input. There it is at the bottom, surround input. So you got surround outputs and surround inputs. So in the idea of what Antelope tried to do is, they chose, instead of using the processing power and the DSP chips inside the unit uh, to process plugins, instead we're gonna have it process a complete surround setup with EQ, speaker correction, room correction, delay compensation, all that kind of stuff. So they dedicated all the resources for this instead of for monitoring uh, purposes. Um, and it's up to you if which one is more important to you. Um, but if you want to do mo direct monitoring with using plugins, you cannot do that on the Gen 4. And if you want to have a way around it, I made a separate video using the Waves uh, Performer Rack, and you should look at that video on my YouTube channel, and it explains to you how to do direct monitoring using plugins and EQ and processing and everything, even with the Gen 4, uh, without having DSP processing. Um, but the alternative that they use this for the surround system, which is a really cool feature for us who are trying to get into surround setup without having to break the bank on very, very expensive gear to implement surround setup in your studio. So that's this. Okay, now that we've broken those down, let's kind of talk through how signal chain works. The foundation, always the foundation of routing, you got to understand signal chain and where the audio coming from and to, and then that would simplify routing. So I would highly recommend to not skip through this part because once you understand signal chain, everything else will be significantly simpler. The way signal chain works on the Orion. Up here you have line, you have inputs, let's kind of talk through it. The first set is line inputs, and then you have the ADAT inputs, surround inputs, and then you have the mixer, which is your mix one, the left and right of mix one, left and right of mix two, mixer two, mixer three, and mixer four, as well as all your surround. I have the MADI and the here is if I want to add more DAW inputs. Right now they looked like grayed out because I'm working USB, not Thunderbolt, so I can only have 32, but if you're working Thunderbolt, you can have up to 128. Uh, and then here is my MADI input. Let's just add one of them so you guys can see it. So this, the inputs are audio signal that are, goes inside the interface. So uh, those are my line inputs, my uh, my DAW playback, so DAW output is my playback from Pro Tools, 
this is the playback from this headphones mixes one, two, three, and four. This is the playback from the surround outputs. And then here's my ADAT inputs. Now, if you go down at the bottom, you're gonna see line outputs, physical line outputs. You're gonna see your monitor outputs. You're gonna see your DAW inputs, which is the audio that goes into your DAW to be recorded. This is one of the biggest differences on the Orion. And I like to explain that way because it makes it simpler. Let's uh, pick a practical example. So right now I have my analog synth plugged into channel 27. Uh, let's go to the meters here so we can all see it. You, you guys can see the synth here and I have it right here, 27 and 28. It's a stereo channel and I have 27 and 28 connected to it. This is my synth is connected to the analog physical analog input of the Orion Gen 4 channel 27, line input 27 and line input 28. That does not mean that when I open Pro Tools or Logic and then I select input 27 and 28, I'm gonna get any signal. And that's the problem that a lot of people run into. It's like, well, I opened my Logic or Pro Tools and I have this plugged into 27 and 28 and I start to record and I'm getting no signal because what you need to do now, here's channel 27 and 28. I need to grab this and drag it and put it in my DAW input. You guys see that line down here? Here is my DAW input, which I'm telling the Orion, where is this channel gonna go when I record using my DAW? It could be you can grab it 27 and 28 and put it into DAW 27 and 28, so you're making it almost like a one-to-one -one if you want to, or you could put it anywhere. So right now I'm gonna grab, uh, and you can put it in multiple places at the same time, like you can duplicate it if you want to. So right now you guys see channel 27 and 28 is plugged in here, and actually it's plugged in channel 29 and 30 in my DAW input. And the way I would recognize that, I'm gonna change this into DAW input. There you go. So now the left window right here is my line input. The right input is the right window is my DAW input. And you guys can see on the left side is playing in channel 27 and 28. On the right side is actually channel 29 and 30. It's also showing in one and two, but that's also that is only for the video purposes. I'm duplicating the channel so that way you can guys can hear when I play the synth in one and two. Uh, but it is coming in here. Now, what's the advantage of this? What's the purpose? The purpose of this is that I have in my, I have a bunch of analog line inputs connected to my line input. I have uh, some of my interface. I have, I'm sorry, I have some of my uh, hardware preamps that are plugged into, and you guys can see them here, for example. So channel under my line inputs on my setup, channel nine to 16 is my patch bay. Then channel 17 is my heritage audio four channels, and then my Vintec audio, and then my APIs, and then my analog synth, and then my summing, and then my talkback. Uh, I have a bunch of analog stuff connected. I also have a bunch of digital stuff connected. Here's my ADAT. I have eight channels of ADAT connected using my 4710 up here. Um, I also have some MADI stuff connected through my RME uh, unit. Now I'm having a whole lot of channels. You can have over a hundred of worth of channels connected into that setup. And then I'm choosing which one of these channels I want to record into my system. And I'm gonna drag and drop these into my DAW input. And you guys can see here my DAW input, I am channel one and two is headphone mix four. I'm gonna record that. I wanna record 470 channel three and four. I wanna record my heritage audio. I wanna record my patch bay, the inputs from the outputs from my patch bay, my Vintec audio. Here's my analog summing. Here's my analog synth. And then it's basically a drag and drop at this point. And that's how I would build my DAW input. Right now, my DAW input are only 32 because I'm working USB. But if I am working Thunderbolt, you would deactivate 33 to 64, 65 to 96, and 97 to 128. I'm just hiding those now because I'm not using them. Line outputs, let's talk another uh, example. You have uh, in your, whether it's Pro Tools or Logic, then you have, you wanna set your stereo speakers, right? So in Pro Tools, 
or logic, you have your stereo output one and two, and you want that to be your main mix that you want to send to your speakers. I'm going to go up here to DAW output. Here's DAW output, which is the outputs from your Pro Tools or Logic, the first two channels inside Pro Tools, which is output one left and output two right, uh, output one left and right. And then I'm going to grab this and choose where I want to send it. So right here, I'm sending it to monitor left and right. That means I grabbed my first set of outputs on my software and I assigned those to the physical outputs on the back of the unit, which is left and right that feeds my speakers. I can also, and you guys can see them, I also drag them and I plug them to my SPDIF output. Uh, because I have SPDIF output coming out of my unit that feeds my monitor controller and I want to give it a digital signal and do some conversion on the monitor controller unit that I use, the Grace Design. And you can send that to anything. I've had somebody ask me about how would you use analog summing with this unit. So you guys can see right here, I am gumming my DAW output channel 17 all the way to 32 is my summing. Sum 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 until 16. And then I'm going to grab all 16 of those and now I need to assign them to physical analog outputs on the back of the unit and I assign them down here to channel, I, in this case I did it one to one, 17 to 32 physical analog outputs off the unit. So on the back of the unit DB25, I came out DB25 and I plugged it to my uh, Dangerous Music Bus LT which also takes DB25 so then it works out fine without a problem. So this is how I would assign something like that. Then I came out of my, for example, um, the summing and I came back into my interface and I plugged it into physically to the back of the interface into channel 29 and 30 right here. And then I'm going to grab these and I assign them into my DAW in the last two channels of DAW input. So that way when I open my Pro Tools or Logic and I'm mixing, this is what I receive my analog input from my analog summing. Um, the cool thing here is you can literally attach anything to anywhere however you want to and there is really no limitation. Also one of the superior advantages to the analog that I absolutely love and in my opinion it was a game changer for me from the other interfaces like the UA is I can take one input and I can send it to multiple outputs. So um, let's just pick a practical example. Here's my uh, synth. It's an input 27. So I ch chose that input and I grabbed it to in the output section and I put it into the DAW to be recorded in the DAW uh, in channel 29 and 30. I also took that and I put it down here in mix 4 in these two channels in mix 4. And you guys can see if I choose my mixer, this mixer, then mixer 4, you'll see here these two channels is the PDL which is the poly D and here's the signal from it. Now I can also duplicate it so I can literally put it in channel these two and the two next to it make it twice. Here you go and then I can also take it and send it to the first mixer and then I can take it and send it to my MADI output channel 1 and 2. And I can take it and send it to my ADAT output channel 3 and 4. And I can take it and send it to a physical line output from my unit. Uh, let's say I want to send it to physical line output 3 and 4 and I can do that as well. So you, you can get the, take the same signal and send it to as many outputs as you want and these could be a digital outputs or physical outputs, a combination of both, and as many times as you want. Which makes the unit works as literally a completely flexible digital analog patch bay where you can move any signal to anywhere. Um, I actually use that uh, in my setup, which I'm going to make a separate video about that. But just a quick example here in my setup, I have, let's say I'm tracking this and uh, I have ADAD outputs coming from my unit, goes to a Behringer P16, the headphone units. Um, so I would take, for example, uh, the Poly D, the synth, and I will put it into mixer 1, into channel 1 and 2, 
and I'll take the output of mixer one, channel one and two, I'll send that to ADAT output one and two, which will be the first two channels on the ADAT, and then they get to hear this. And that's if I wanna send them a Q mix. Now if I wanna give them direct signal, I can literally just grab the poly D synth, these two, and I can grab them and just drag them directly to, where is ADAT outputs? Here it is, here's ADAT outputs. I can take that and I just grab it, put it straight into ADAT outputs, and now when I play, it would automatically show on the first two channels of their Behringer, poly, uh, uh, Behringer P16 units. Um, I also, another example that I use is, you guys can see here on my DAW outputs, my first output is main, left and right, which is my main mix. Then I created my DAW output three and four, I called it mix B, left and right, five and six, mix C, and mix D. And then what I did is I uh, grabbed those, and then you guys can see here, there I assigned them to my MADI output. And what it did, I just, uh, on my Grace design, it receives signal, digital signal, so I send it to MADI outputs to these eight channels. And then on my Grace design now, I can just simply switch between uh, my main stereo mix, my mix A, my mix B, and my mix C. And in my DAW, I can have three different songs that I'm referencing, and then I can have the main one that I'm mixing would be the main mix, and then song number two, I'm sending it to mix B, song number three, I'm sending it to mix C, and I can quickly switch between mixes to AB stuff. That could be AB mixes, that could be um, you wanna process a unit through a hardware insert or something like that, and then you wanna to AB the unit with the hardware processing and without the hardware processing. Uh, I mean, you can use it to your advantage and the limitation, uh, uh, there is no limitation. You could do whatever you want to do and there is like a lot of possibilities here because of how flexible that routing is. Okay, now let's talk about the surround setup because it's one of the biggest differences and upgrades that the Orion 32 Plus Gen 4 has that the Gen 3 doesn't have. And basically it was Antelope, they were trying to implement some of the surround features similar to what they have in the Galaxy and try to put that into the Orion Gen 4 and that's why they took all the AFX stuff out. I personally think it has a lot of potential and it might be a great affordable solution for a lot of people who are wanting to start working with surround setup, especially Adobe Atmos, not just like a 5.1 or a 7.1 without having to break the bank on a very, very expensive purchase. All right, so let's kind of dig in on the surround. So here's the surround tap right here and then uh, once you go to the surround setup the first thing you want to check here's all different speaker configurations that you have all from 2.0 to 2.1 to 3.0 and then it's all the way to 9.1.6 I mean, this is kind of everything you would need from Adobe Atmos setup pretty much um, so let's just start with a 2.1 because it's a really simple setup um, and then I know some people are going to say well why do a surround in 2.1. It's obviously not a surround and I get it, but there's an advantage here that I'm gonna explain in just a second that it's actually a really good thing that Antelope have added and it could be used. I know they meant it for surround, but I think there's a better, uh, not better, there's a different application to it that could be really helpful for people with room correction. So if I go to stereo setup, I got my left speaker, I got my right speaker, and then I got here a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight band EQ on that speaker. The first uh, band is a shelf, so two are shelves, one is a low end shelf and one is a high end shelf, and then six are just band EQ. And you can basically implement speaker correction, a room correction, in your room, like I'm literally doing this right now, but I use my Grace Design M908 monitor controller for doing the final tuning in my room. I don't, I personally don't use any of like the Sonarworks softwares or any of that kind of stuff. Uh, I try to tune my room as much as I can before, and then the fine tuning, I use some DSP from my monitor controller. The advantage of this now, everything is going to play back through the interface is going to be monitor controlled and is going to be tuned according to that setting. So I can go in here and I can say, let's say my room has uh, a dip at 70. This is a pretty common dip that you would find in a lot of rooms. So I'm just going to um, 
grab that frequency here. I put it at 70 hertz. And let's say when I took my room measurements, I found that the dip was about 3 dB. So I'm just going to take that and see here. And then I'm compensating 3 dB at 70. Here is 3 dB at 70, and here's the cue for it. And this is what I did to the right speaker. I could do different to the left speaker, or I can just copy that speaker, and then go to the other one, and then I can paste it. And then now I have an actual EQ applied to my speaker. And now you can obviously do different stuff. Um, and then you can up here at the bypass, and then you can bypass the EQ. And so you can listen with and without. Um, as well as some a little bit of speaker, uh, like the delay on the speaker, and then also a decibel level for the speaker that you can compensate if you feel like one speaker is louder than the other, which is all determined by measurements. If you, like I use the REW software, the Room EQ Wizard, and then I use one of the uh, Behringer mic room tuning, uh, and then I load its profile inside that software, and I kind of measure the, the room that way. Uh, but this is a... This is a game changer. This is allows a lot of smaller studios that cannot afford spending thousands of dollars on Trinov, but then also don't want to use the sonar works that they would room tune the room this way. And then boom, you got yourself some fine EQ correction for the room. We spent tons of money to be able, I mean, I spend over $8,000 on my monitor controller because it has that feature in it. Now you get that built into the interface, which is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, now that's a, that's a stereo setup. Like, let's now pick a different one. Let's say we're going to be working 2.1. So uh, you got, um, let me just remove that EQ that I did so that way it doesn't mess up. Okay, it's flat, copy speaker, and I'm going to paste it to the right speaker. Okay, now let's say 2.1. You got two speakers and you got a sub. Now, you guys will notice the moment that I did this, now there is an LFE, which is where your sub is at. And now you also have a base management. They have complete base management feature built into the software, which is actually very extensive and detailed. And I think it's great uh, to start with. So let's see, you see here base management. There's on and off. Here's your crossover. And then where is it happening on the sub? And then now you can see the speakers and you can see the crossover on the speakers as well and at which frequency it starts to cross over. And you can still apply the same room correction EQ to your speakers. Um, you can turn the bass management completely off if you are using, um, like I used to have um, JBL uh, uh, speakers, LSR speakers with the sub and they had their own bass management software in it. So I wouldn't need the bass management from here, but if you're using um, something that doesn't have base management software, you can do this one. Um, once I turn the base management on, and then I actually go to that little mixer down here, and now you guys can see this new mixer shows up. And then you see high pass and low pass. And you can see here the high pass is at 80 hertz. And this is for the left speaker and the right speaker. And then I can just change where that high pass frequency is. And then you guys can see down here is the low pass, and then I can change the frequency for that one as well. And then I can, uh, here's the sub, here's the volume for the sub versus the volume for the speaker. You have cutoff, you have filtering, the type of the filter, you have the cutoff, you have bypass for, for the high pass and the low pass, and you have, it's, there's a lot of controls that you could do, you can literally fine tune your base management until you get it to exactly how you want it. But here's the cool thing. You can get it to exactly how you want it and then you get to save it. Uh, so think of it this way. Uh, I use the, the Barefoot MM27 and they have this meme technology right here. And you guys probably have seen these before which has like four different speaker settings and one of them is a hi-fi speaker. So I could use something like this and then I can tune my room, get my flat, and then save that preset as more my flat. And then I would do another setup that was more of a hyped low end because I want to push that low end a little bit more. And then the goal is to listen in a hyped low end environment so that way I can check my mix if 
what would it sound like in something that is a really bass heavy. And then I can create different presets and then I can literally reference the mix on these different presets. And then all these presets would go into my hardware presets like I showed you guys earlier, you can save the preset, you can say only save the surround feature in there. Okay, now let's move down. I'm not gonna run through all of them because it's a lot, but here you go. If let's say you're doing Adobe Atmos 7.1.4, it's a very common setup. So you got left, center, right, and then you got the height speakers and you got a, a sub, and then here is you got your sides, you got your rear and the rear height speakers. Then you can literally apply individual EQ to every individual one of those speakers. Now remember, this is not done automatically. It's not like the interface came with a software and a mic and then you tell it tune and then it tunes everything for you on its own. You'll actually have to set up your mic, use something like a Room EQ Wizard or a different, any software that you prefer for room tuning, do your measurements and then compensate with the EQ in here and then measure again. That includes compensation or delays between speakers and all that kind of stuff. So yes, I get it, it gets a, it's a little bit more work, but also you're not spending thousands and thousands of dollars on that feature. Uh, also not to mention, so this feature, if you just buy the interface, uh, that feature will be locked and you actually have to buy the software for, I believe it's as of right now, it's $6.99, buy it from Antelope's website and then it becomes like an activation license and then you can activate it to your device, and then it unlocks the feature. Now, if you bought the MRC controller, then it comes with a license. So when you activate your controller with your interface, uh, it does have the surround feature license. And then here's all different features. Now, let's kind of talk, how do we use it? So let's say we have uh, simple, 2.1 and then we did some room correction that we, you know, we, this is just gonna be a bunch of random. Here we go, we did some EQ and correction. And then I'm gonna take it from my right speaker, paste it on my left speaker. It's not like if I play music right now, it's just gonna play through this. I also need to route this correctly in the routing setup. So let's go back to routing. This is where the surround outs comes in handy and let's do surround in as well. Here you go, surround in. So I'm gonna take my output one and two from my DAW, which is my main mix. And because this is not a surround, it's only two channels, left and right. And then I'm gonna grab that and put it in surround out. I'm sorry, in surround in, here you go you guys this so that way there you go and I put my main outputs under surround in and then I'm gonna take my surround out and then I'm gonna take that and put it on my physical outputs which is going to be my monitors one and two Basically, it's the same idea if you guys watched my uh, previous video uh, with the Gen 3 and how we ran the AFX, which is like you send audio to uh, an effect channel and that channel brings it back and then you place it where you wanted it to go. It's the same idea. I'm sending my output from my, my interface from my DAW to the eff effects, which in this case, the effects is the surround uh, room correction. And then I grab it back from the surround and I assign where's that output gonna go. Is it gonna go to my monitor output left and right or is it gonna go to my line output one, two, three, four. So if I'm doing Adobe Atmos setup, obviously, I'm gonna do in my DAW output one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight until 16 outputs, name them and label them however I want to. I'll take these and send them to the surround in all 16 channels, and then I'll take the 16 channels of surround in and I would probably assign them to the first 16 line outputs of the interface because they're gonna feed 16 different speakers. Um, that's, and I'm trying to explain it in a very simple way, but that's pretty much how it would work to be able to run your surround. Or in this scenario right now where, you, where we set it up, I don't even run surround uh, and I'm using it for room correction for a stereo setup. Because some uh, will ask, well, or some will think that, 
well, the Gen 4 is just done for surround. If I don't have a surround setup, then I don't need to buy a Gen 4. But you can implement it for a stereo setup and you get like a built-in room correction that comes along with it, which is very helpful. Um, and honestly, it's a great feature that I really, really like. Uh, now you have surround level, then you got monitor level, um, and then you got the basic stuff like dim and mute. And then on the monitor, you got mono, the mute and mono. And then right here, you got a bypass button, which you can see have a surround tab, completely bypass the surround, bypass the surround EQ, bypass the surround delays or the total delays applied on the speakers. You guys can see that the bass management right now is actually turned off because we selected 2.0 speakers, only two speakers. There's no subs, but if I go to the surround tab and I'm selecting a 2.1 setup, you'll see that my bass management now has an on and off feature and has that mixer for the bass management. I kind of really like that bass management because I was actually thinking about buying a second set of uh, speakers with a sub and then um, I might actually just route those second set of speakers to the sub straight to the Orion and then uh, run the bass management from here and that will become like a, a different listening environment uh, that I can reference my mixes uh, on it. I think this is pretty much uh, everything in terms of patching that console, all the features and the settings of that console. I hope this video was helpful for you and I know several people have requested it. Uh, please make sure to share it, subscribe to the channel, and if you have any questions, don't hesitate to comment below or uh, you can email me at fadey at I'll see you guys at the next video.